Hello and welcome to Lessons Podcast. This week, Luke and Jay talk with Dale Willis, a careers expert with decades of experience in helping young people realise and achieve their ambitions. Dale talks about the details behind a great CV, the positives and negatives of further education versus the workplace, and what young people need to be doing to smash any interview. This is such a valuable episode for anyone that's unsure about their future career and education options. But before we begin, I would just like to ask our listeners to follow our podcast if you're listening along on Spotify and subscribe uh, if you're listening on YouTube. As a new podcast, this really helps us. But otherwise, uh, sit back and enjoy. Joining us. Yep, thank you very much. Um, we'll jump in with our first question, as always. What is the most important lesson you've ever learned? Do you know, I think the most important lesson I've ever learned, um, which goes across not just my professional no. life but my personal life as well, is if you do stuff, stuff happens. And so it's really about um, if you sit around waiting for stuff to happen, it's not going to happen. But whether that's in, in a careers basis, trying to get into some companies, trying to talk to some people, or in your personal life, trying to um, trying to achieve some stuff, if you if you do stuff stuff will happen and and I think that's the most important thing I've learned. Um, Yeah, Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and and what you do. So I run a non-profit organisation called My Great First Job. Um, My Great First Job, um, we're we're a social enterprise, we're a community interest company and our purpose is to help young people get the information that they need to make great decisions in their life. Um, based around career stuff. So it could be young people leaving school at year 11. Um, It could be people who are leaving the sixth form college, people leaving university. But getting access to information that they're not seeing anywhere else so that that they can make the right decision for them and feel more informed in making that decision. So we do um, a lot of school talks. um, We have um, some webinars that we do in the evening. Um, We have quite a lively social media presence. And so we're engaging with young people and trying to make sure all the stuff that's happening out there that nobody knows is going on, that, that young people are getting that information. So that's the, that's the purpose of my great first job. Okay, brilliant. How long have you been doing that for? So we've been going for um, three years. Um, yeah. So t- um, it started really with, um, with me just running some really small community events. In, I'd hire a local community centre, which is very localised in Northampton. I'd hire a, a, a community centre, a room, put some flyers around, um, put some on Facebook um, advertising for that area and, um, and just see who came. And then I'd, I'd deliver the session for free and then we'd maybe sell some packs at the end of it to cover the room hire. And, um, and then maybe somebody might say at the end of it, could you help me on a one-to-one basis? You know, when COVID came along, that sort of changed everything because we couldn't run those events anymore. I went on a, um, on a Zoom webinar about something else and just thought, hey, I, th- I think we can make this work online. And, um, and so we, we moved everything online and, and it's taken the whole um, business to a whole new level. So right. we've had over two and a half thousand young people um, log in and join us live for our webinars on Monday evenings. And, and, and another 2,000 have, have, have asked for the, um, for the recordings. Um, we're now doing so many more schools talks because teachers have come on those webinars and seen it. And when we're doing the webinars, we've got people coming on um, predominantly from the UK, but whereas before our, our work was entirely Northampton based, now it's all over the country. And, and there, is always, there are always people on from abroad. So we have a guy log in from Baghdad University, oh. most webinars, because he's helping young people um, from Iraq um, um, figure out how to get a job in England when they come over. Okay. Um, we have people from international schools in Luxembourg and Dubai um, come on where, where parents are working abroad and, they're, and, they're, and they're young, their children go to school there. So it's, it's become something much bigger than just this small local community centre based thing in, in Northampton. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant, that sounds really good. So from your, your experience of, of the job market and of young people, if you had to pinpoint it, what would you say the hardest thing that young people face in the job market at the minute is? I, th- I, think, there are, I think some of the hardest things that they come across is that nobody shows you how to do a great CV. And I've seen some amazing, amazing young people um, p- predominantly those leaving sixth form who've decided not to go to university and they've got some amazing qualifications they do some phenomenal things and, and then they'll come to me and say I've been applying for degree apprenticeships I've not been getting anywhere can you have a look at it and the first thing I do is have a look at their CV yeah. and, it, and it's apparent immediately and that's because um, it, it, it's not embedded in the curriculum at school to, to teach people how to do an amazing CV yeah. 
And, and, and so amazing at school tends to be, oh, I'll write a two or three um, page one. I'll use my personal statement from university and I'll, and I'll put that in to a CV format. And that just doesn't work at all. Yeah. Um, so I think getting that CV done in, in a way that is short, concise, people worry that they're not putting a ton of stuff on, but people don't need to see a ton of stuff. So I think that's, a, that's an issue for them. Um, I, think, I think one of the biggest problems is knowing where to look. You know, when I was, when I was leaving school, there was only one place to look, and that was mm. the Chronicle and Echo. That yeah. was it. Yeah. There was nowhere else you could get a job. My mum would come, I would come home from school, my mum would have got the cron and she would have circled the jobs that she thought I should have gone for. And, <laughs> and, and that, was, that was how everybody, it happened. Yeah. And now everything bypasses parents and, and, and there are so many job boards and online places. It can, become, it can become really, really challenging for young people. They often don't hear back when they apply because yeah. there's so many people applying for it. So I think that's a real challenge, knowing where to look, having a great CV to send in as well. And then just knowing what's out there. I think there's an enormous pressure on young people to have decided at 16, 18, 21 what they're going to do with their life. You know, what are you going to be? And, you know, you've been at school. You, you know, you're still figuring that out. Yeah. I'm still figuring that out now. What am I going to be? You know, I've got another 20 years, 30 years to go, hopefully. Um, and I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do. Yeah. So I think um, young people put themselves under a lot of pressure to have got it all figured out at 18, 19. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that having a great CV and um, and knowing where to look can be can be really helpful. Definitely. So, if you had like a few tips for putting a CV together, yeah, what would they be? What would do you look for in a CV when? You okay, so don't use a template mm -hmm. um, because um, I have yet to see a template that that works for young people. The, the, the most phenomenal thing about young people when they leave school, college, or university is the qualification they've just done. In most cases, we're not going to have amassed a body of work that means that that's going to be more important than my qualifications. Yeah. And most templates put that at the bottom of your CV, and we need it at the top. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think the biggest thing they can do is, is in that um, personal summary that sits at the top of their CV, is um, to make sure that it's really short, four really clear sentences. Who I am, what I'm bringing to the table, what I'm looking for from you, and if I've got an extra bit that I want to tell you about my height, it's like a highlights reel. Yeah. So take all the teamwork in. I'm a great team player. I communicate really well because nobody's going to say the opposite of that. So make sure that personal statement is really short, tells the employer what you want from them and tells them what you're bringing to the table. I think that's important. Keep it to one page. There is, uh, there is not going to be anybody um, as a young person who's going to need a CV that's longer than a page. Yeah. Um, keep it to one page. If you can say it in one word instead of five words, do that. Yeah. Um, and don't worry about putting references on your CV. It's not adding any value whatsoever. Take, um, take that little bit of space that that frees up to say a bit more about you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. So in the time that you've worked in, in this space, in this career space, what do you think has been the biggest change from when you first started working with young people in getting into jobs to now? Okay. Well, w I mean, there are some phenomenal changes, really. I mean, when I started, um, I, I, s I set up a business in 1989 um, to try and help young people find their first job. That was when I started. I had a typewriter. You know, computers, <laughs> there, there weren't any computers. Yeah. Um, so I typed CVs on a manual typewriter. So, you know, that's a bit of a change. Yeah. Um, there, were, there were companies that, um, that would say, oh, w if a girl comes along for a job, you know, we only let go. This is in Northampton. If a girl comes along for a job, we'll, we'll only allow um, girls to wear um, skirts. We don't oh. allow girls to wear trousers. I mean, that yeah. seems phenomenal that yeah. that, you know, it seems like yeah, another world. Yeah. But, but that is the case. You know, I, I didn't give this person a job because they didn't wear a tie for an interview. Mm. You know, that, that, so all of that sort of like um, um, formality, I think, has, has, has changed and, and for the better as well. Um, there are jobs that used to exist that don't exist anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. I think um, I think more young people are looking at a, a portfolio of options, so mm -hmm. not necessarily thinking just about, oh, I have to do a nine-to-five job, yeah. but they're more confident to do freelancing, more confident to, to do um, additional jobs as well. Um, you know, an additional job before might have been I worked behind a, a bar, I, I worked in a cafe, maybe now it's a whole range of stuff around skills that they've got. So I think that's changed. But um, I, think, I think when, in 1989, 1990, there was a, young people will have been under pressure to make that right decision. You're gonna be in that job for 15, 20 years. 
not now. You know, yeah. people are thinking I might be in this job for two or three years and then I'll be thinking about where to go next. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's very true. Yeah, Especially with, with our experiences of, of university and stuff. People, I think nowadays they tend to sort of take like gap filler jobs, don't they? Yeah. So you leave university and you might go and a lot of my friends at the minute, the big thing is going and working in recruitment and they'll go and get a job in recruitment for a couple of years just to gain some skills of actually being in a workplace. Because I know a lot of people that have left uni at 22, 23, and they've never been inside an office. They've yeah. never been in a workplace. They might have had a Saturday job in the shop or something, but they've never actually been in a workplace. So I think now it's very common for people to just take jobs that they know they're not going to do forever, but it's just to get that little bit of experience yeah. in. Yeah, Is just sort of figure out what, what you're good at. Yeah. You know, have a, spend a couple of years figuring out what you're good at, what you like, and then get a job that's got a bit more of that in and a bit less of the stuff that you don't like in it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a bit of a culture shock for students when they go from, you know, waking up at 10 a.m. and just doing not really a lot to going and working full time, having a routine, being up and out by a certain time. Um, so like you said, with a lot of students not really having an office background and they've just it's the first thing they've gone to I think no one's really looking I'm going to stay in this job forever and work my way up it's kind of just like you said yeah just get a bit of experience and it's it, it kind of goes into people skills as well how you pe how you behave in an office and customer service working with the public I think it all it all ties together but yeah it's definitely a good thing to do for experience definitely so on on that note of sort of university students from your experience working with people that have gone to uni and people that have gone straight into work, people that might have even, back when you could, gone into work straight after year 11, do you think university overall is worth it for, for your sort of generic degree? I know if you want to go into medicine, you have to, you don't have a choice. Yeah. But for jobs where you can just go and get a job in it, do you think university is worth it? Well, I think it really depends on, 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 on what your perception is about the importance of university and the importance of education. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that going to university should all be about going to university to get a job yeah um so i think education per se is a, is an is an amazing tool um and, and and just learning and continuing to stay in learning is great and if and if, if you want to go and, and do some learning on a on a subject that um that you might not be able to get a job in afterwards i, I don't think that's necessarily a um a bad thing but i think you've got to be clear about why you're going um and what you're going to do um, so for some people going to university, I want to get these skills because this is a this is a recognised route into that job, um, or companies recruit graduates from this university or from this course. Yeah. Some people are going to go to university because do you know what they just want to they're interested in that topic and they and they're going to continue to learn about it. And I I think I think that's if that's just as important. Um, mm -hmm. w when people leave and, and go in, and, and I'll just pick up, you can leave school at, uh, after year 11 and get a job, yeah. um, and get an apprenticeship. Yeah. Um, it's often spoken around, particularly by schools, as um, the, the raising of the school leaving age. And, and that was never the case. Uh, and what it was, was that you can't opt out of education until you're 18. So an employer yeah. can take you on at 16, but they have to do that with a training program or an yeah. apprenticeship. And so, so I think um, you've got to do what's right for you and, and just try and figure that out. Um, and, and just wh what, do I, what do I think I'm going to be right for me? Where do I think I should be? Ha be thinking about that. What do I want to achieve? For some people, that's going to be leaving school at 16. For some people, that's going to be leaving school or college at 18. For some people, that's going to be going to university. But I don't subscribe really to the, to, to the, to the thing of, oh, it's universities all going to university just to get a job because I think learning as a, as a concept, yeah. um, education takes us to places we never knew we would go. Yeah. And the more education we've got, and the more education, particularly people who might have not have considered going to university, the more opportunities to get educated and continue in their education, I think that's amazing. Yeah. I definitely agree. I think it, for myself, I, went, I did a politics degree at uni. I'm never gonna be a politician, but before I went to uni, I'd gone and, and worked in an office and realised it wasn't for me. So my most important thing about going to uni was to do something that I knew I'd enjoy and yeah. I knew I would enjoy politics. For me, the most important thing about uni was more the, the people that I met and the experiences that I had. And I think that's made me more employable, not just the qualification. The qualification's great, don't get me wrong, but I'd, I'd consider myself more employable because of the experiences I had at uni and the different people that I met and sort of going out your comfort zone a little bit and being shown a different group of people to the people that you've just grown up with for the past sort of 15 yeah. and, years. And also, if you've done a politics degree, um, you know, a whole bunch of that will have been about 
um, thinking about the way other people think, yeah. um, understanding that other different people's starting points, understanding um, and the way that different values that people have, and and, thing, and, and those are just super important things to have. Yeah, um, definitely are. Yeah, definitely are. So, do you think that um, moving away from university, sort of the people that we have on this podcast are a mixture between um, so far people that have sort of gone through education and found education sort of very useful and then a lot of people that have found themselves running their own businesses and they've found that as the route to go down rather than your sort of conventional job market do you think that education as a whole prepares people to go and set up their own business well, well no it doesn't at all because that's not the purpose of it um i think education per the purpose of education right now in this country is to pass exams yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and that's the purpose of it. You know, here's the curriculum. I'm going to get you through this and we're going to teach you the knowledge that you need on that day to pass your exam on that day. And that's because the way we judge as, as a society, the way that we judge schools is on their results. So when you've got everybody going around saying, you know, I'm going to send my kid to a good school that's going to get good results, you're, you're already sort of perpetuating that system, really, yeah. because you're saying the important, most important thing about it is the, the, the grades that they're going to get for their GCSEs or for their A-levels. So I don't think um, the education system as a whole um, prepares us for a whole bunch of stuff, mm. let alone um, um, working, working for ourselves you know, yeah. and, and, and setting up our own businesses. Yeah. Do you think it should? Because obviously there's, there's an argument that not everybody can be their own boss. You have to have employees for, for, the, you know, for society to work. You have to have people that go into work. So do you think school should really encourage people to take that route of you know, go and be an entrepreneur and go and work for yourself? Or do you think it's sort of works the way it is of, you know, if that's something you want to do, you'll find it? I think probably I'd, I'd, I'd come at it from a slightly different angle is, is around, I think ed the education system um, ought to be looking at developing a range of skills that could be used in different ways. Yep. So the education system, the way we work at the moment, doesn't, for example, um, doesn't, for example, teach us um, how to have difficult conversations, doesn't teach us... Um, how to, doesn't teach us about empathy, doesn't teach us about people skills in, in a particular way. So I'm, I'm not sure that um, I, would, I would say the education system, the job of the education system is to create entrepreneurs and to create young people. But I think the job of the education system is to, is to, is to develop us as a person yeah. um, because then those of us that want to do those things will have enhanced um, skills, pers yeah. per personality yeah. skills, to be able to um, to do that. That said, you know, th I think there is a space on the curriculum for um, for entrepreneurial skills. You know, if you're yeah. a photographer, um, if you're a videographer, um, and, and you want to do this, let's make sure you've got the information yeah. so that how you can how you can do that. And mm -hmm. you know, we we ran a webinar um, last year on. Um, on the legalities of going to work. It covered things like tax, national insurance, contract of employment, um, all the deductions you might get out of your salary, why you can't take a holiday when you want, all of those things that about going to work. Yeah. And, you know, and it was brand new to every single person on yeah. there. And they were all sixth formers. Yeah. And, you know, and they, they don't know what tax is and why are we paying tax and what does yeah. it go for? And why is paying tax um, seen as something that's part an integral part of society and who pays for the hospital and why why can't i do all of these things and and you know and that that societal stuff isn't isn't really taught at schools yeah yeah i definitely. feel like it's a lot more aimed just academic and knowledge of certain subjects instead of going out into the world and like you said why is tax like why do people pay tax why do you do this how certain people are like you said with difficult conversations it's kind of there's not really like a life skills area on the curriculum. I mean, there's, as you get older into sixth form, we've got like, we had like free periods certain days. So you'd come in uh, and say have a lesson in the morning, then have a free period and then one in the afternoon and then a free last. I mean, there's, there's plenty of opportunity to add in, even if it's just an hour, an hour a day or not an hour a day, say a couple of hours a week at that. There is opportunity to put it in, but I just don't think that people really take it into consideration because yeah. the teachers, they've already got those skills from them growing up to where they are now. So I don't really think that it's taken into consideration as much as it should be. Well, it's just passing exams, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I yeah. think, you know, um, I think it's, it's sometimes easy for us to blame schools because, um, because, but they're just delivering the system. Yeah. Um, you know, so teachers are being measured 
um, within that school on, on their exam success. They're mm -hmm. not always being measured yeah. on how well that person has left as a developed person. As yeah. a, be, the teacher have been measured by that. They're under pressure. The schools are under pressure because us as a society put them under that pressure. Yeah. So it, it's really um, the education system doesn't um, get chosen by the school. It's, it's chosen by... The, by the government, if yeah. you like, and you know, yeah. what do we yeah. as a government think? And and I think um, my gut feeling is is that we we don't give people the skills to be successful um, yeah. all the while. Yeah. Do you think that's something that should change in the near future? Do you think? How am I trying to say? Um, do you think it should be more focused towards building? the youth as a person rather than just passing tests? Oh, absolutely. You know, building resilience. You know, we're all going to get knocked down. It's not going to go, you know, just thinking about those things. And, and, it, and instead of it being something that might happen in PHSE on that week, if yeah. so-and-so is not in, it being an integral, an integral part of it. Um, yeah. And I was, I was working with a, um, a school um, a couple of years ago, and there was a there was a it's an example I regularly use. There was a young girl um, who I was asked to mentor on a one to one basis to who wasn't going to university, um, and um, and and she told me you know, we met for twenty minutes, and she told me all about the stuff that she did that wasn't at school, and it turned out that she was um, she was a really really highly um, recognised gymnast. She'd competed um, she'd competed for the England um, squad in in, a, in in a particular type of gymnastics. And now she, and that was when she was about 15, 16. And, and now she, she teaches on a Saturday morning um, at a really high level and doing that. And, and I was, I left the, the session, and I mean, it was great. I found out the information I needed to write her CV up. And I left the session, I was walking back to the school reception um, with, her, with her form tutor, um, who was also her, uh, her mentee, a mentor as well. And I said, Isn't it amazing that that person, blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, You know, all that stuff she does at the weekend, she's been in this gymnastic squad for the for the for the country she teaches this you know this teacher stopped me and to his credit said i feel really ashamed because i've known this person mm. for all of the sixth form i had no idea she did that yeah and um because there's no space for that to happen no. because yeah. because they're under pressure to focus on getting the results done yeah um, and um yeah i think there's plenty of space for us to be looking at developing people rather than people who pass exams. Yeah, it's definitely. difficult for schools, I guess, especially in sixth form, because we were very lucky because our sixth form was tiny. So yeah. we, our head of sixth had a personal relationship with every student in the sixth form. Yeah. And he knew everything about you and you'd be able to go in and have a chat with him and he would know sort of what the issue is and how to solve it. But that was because there was about 40 of us. Yeah, yeah. You go to some schools, like my mum's old school, and they had 300 people in their sixth form and yeah. it's impossible for the head of sixth to have that like personal relationship with 300 Absolutely. students. So, yeah. and like you say, if if the head of sick takes all the time to get that personal relationship with that many people, then something else would drop off on his on his schedule, and yeah. and you know they'd they'd be judged on their results in their class, which would would drop as a result. So, yeah. it's very difficult. And we were very lucky in our school that it was such a small sick form that we were able to yeah. sort of get that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you do you do still build a well, we built a, a very good personal relationship with him. I know a lot of us. I know some people even now may keep in contact, I'm not too sure, but um, but even though there was that personal kind of almost friendship between the two, there was still obviously a very straight to the point, you need to do this, you need yeah, to do yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. So I think it's just finding a, a nice balance between the two um, that, you know, can be quite hard to find. Yeah, because I've sort of heard some examples, like my, my girlfriend in her sick form, I remember her saying that it was a massive sick form and there was such a focus on university. And I remember her saying that as soon as she sort of said that she wasn't applying to a red brick, she didn't get any more meetings with the head of sixth and the, the um, like UCAS person from their school. And all the focus was put onto the students that were applying for the red brick. But then I guess that's because it looks good on the school, doesn't it, if they get... Again, because that's as parents, how we, how we, how we judge that school. You know, yeah, nobody's yeah. going to go into the sixth form and say, how many of your kids left happy? Yeah. They're going to say, <laughs> yeah. how many of your kids left and went to Birmingham, went to Exeter, went to Durham, went yeah. to... Lisa. So it's, we, we as a society make that happen. Um, yeah. We get the education system we've asked for, really. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I, and I do recognise that that thing around, you know, I, I, once I've said I'm not going to university, the support wasn't there. Um, and I recognise that wholeheartedly because loads and loads of young people tell me that. And then yeah, it's down to, it's down to there being a teacher that says, "Well, hang on, 
I'll find that out for you. Yeah. And, and there are great teachers doing that, amazing yeah. teachers. Oh, definitely, yeah. And I think that's the work that we try and do really is, um, is try and make sure that young people know that there are amazing opportunities out there. Uh, and but they they need to think about how they're applying for them. They need they need to know when to apply for them so they don't miss them. I, I was working with a with a lad from Northampton a couple of years ago who um, who started a degree apprenticeship after the, the conversation we'd had, and he hadn't heard of them before then. Um, so he had a conversation about it, and I and I said to him, "Why do you think um, you don't find out about degree apprenticeships um, within school?" And this was a couple of years ago, so things have changed a little bit. And he said, because, you know, everybody, nobody at school has done a degree apprenticeship. So there's nobody yeah. to say, hey, I did that and that worked amazing. Yeah. Most people have gone to university straight from school, um, done their degree, done their teaching and, and then started a job. So mm -hmm. that's why I think we do in schools do a phenomenal job of, of getting people's personal statement done, of getting their university applications done. Yeah. But there isn't always the knowledge around what exists. Yeah. And so... You know, it's great when a school will come to us and say, we don't know what we're doing with this. Could you do it for us? Yeah. yeah. Um, and that really is, you know, that vul showing that vulnerability of saying, yeah. I don't know um, how to do this, but we, we think it's really important, you know, for me is, um, is fantastic. And, and, yeah. and, and, and that those schools should be really celebrated. Yeah. yeah. The service that you offer seems just, it seems like something that's just ov so obvious that should be available to, to every student coming to the end of school. Yeah. Is it not something that like lo local authorities offer to schools or is it all done by sort of private com private organisations yeah. like yourself? Yeah, so I mean, I, going back since I, you know, when I first started um, the business that became an apprenticeship business, there, were, there was a statutory career service. So, um, and, and so every school would have um, the, the local council would have bought in a service that was going to be delivered in every single school. The academisation of schools, as they turned into academies, meant that schools could choose how they spent their money slightly differently. So, so in, when schools started opting out of, oh, well, hang on, we don't need to buy that career service in because we can get somebody internally to do it, it almost like then made it less cost effective for anybody to run it because nobody, nobody was buying it at that level. Yeah. And so the service sort of dropped away. And so you've got patches, tiny patches of, of, of stuff going on. And it tends, to be, um, in, it tends to be based around one teacher that is really, really passionate about making sure that happens. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what it's based around. And so, the, I mean, in, um, in Northampton where we are, the, the local council um, and the local town council have, have funded a project with us this year to work with 50 young people who are leaving the sixth form this summer who have decided not to go to university. And we're doing every single one of their CVs and we're preparing them for every interview they go for. And, and so the council have paid for that to happen. And, and maybe 25 years ago, that would have been delivered as part of the offer within a school. Right, okay. okay. Cool. So you mentioned they're preparing people for interviews. Interviewing is probably one of the like hardest things for people to do. I know. Myself, when I left sick form and went and got a um, apprenticeship, the interviews were they were horrible. And I, I'm I like talking in front of people, and I don't mind it at all. I don't really get nervous in them situations. But even so, it was so daunting going into a big office and sitting in a boardroom and you know putting on a suit when you've never done anything like that. So, how do you prepare young people leaving school going into these sort of what they would deem as sort of make or break interviews? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I think um, first of all, I think it's about reframing it, because um, I think, uh, just as you were saying there, a make or break interview, the stress and the pressure that's on a young person to succeed at that interview. So I think it's important to reframe it and think that you're interviewing the company as well. This yeah. is your decision as well. Mm. This company has got to be good enough for you. I want you to get back in the car afterwards and decide whether you want the job, not yeah. whether not get in the car and hope. Oh, I hope they like me because yeah. that's not a great place to be. So yeah. for me, it's about reframing it and saying, this is my career, I'll be deciding whether I work for you, because yeah. I'm bringing a lot to the table, and, um, and you need to impress me. So I think that's the starting point. I think it's all about the preparation, all about the preparation, um, and nobody teaches them how to do that. So it's about all, all the stuff they've got to do beforehand. Um, I think that one of the most important things I say to young people is, remember that an interview isn't a memory test. It, Everybody who's, um, who's going for an interview is a young person going for the first time. The only way they've been measured so far is in a memory test, an exam. And you can't take your books into the exam. Yeah. So, so generally, you've got to, here, here's the curriculum, here's everything you've got to remember. Go into the exam and remember it. 
Mm. And, and an interview isn't like that. When we start work, we don't have to remember anything because we have a book. We write our notes down. Yeah. You know, if I turned up to every meeting I went to with a blank sheet of paper, then the person opposite would quite rightly think, well, hang on, I've had three meetings with this person. Have they, have they not brought anything to the table already? Mm. Um, you know, when you were talking to me about coming here today, you told me what to think about beforehand and stuff. Um, and, it, and it's not a memory test. So I get young people to get their preparation done and then take their preparation in with them. That's a major hurdle because they've never taken their, their prep into anywhere before. Yeah. And so we think that if we take um, a pile of notes into an interview, it's going to make us look stupid. But it's absolutely not. It's going to make us look prepared. It's going to make it look like it was important to us. Yeah. Um, I get young people to think about the questions they want to ask, always ask questions. And, and they'll say to me sometimes, well, I don't know what questions to ask. And it's like, well, what do you want to know? Because mm. if you don't need to know anything, you don't need to go for the interview because you're interviewing the company to see whether it's good enough for you to be there. Yeah. If, you don't need, if you don't need to know anything, just they could just ring you up and say, well, do you want the job or not? So, yeah. so always take questions in, always write them down. Never try and hold that information in your head all the way through. Put it in your pocket. And then when they say to you, have you got any questions? get your questions out and you know you've got them there you haven't and you can be present for the rest of the interview because you're not trying to hold these all this information in your head so i think it's about the preparation reframing it as you interviewing the company and then remembering it's not a memory test just you know you, you, nobody is going to judge you because badly because you've prepared for the interview and and and, and you've taken those notes in with that they're, they're only going to think positive things of you yeah, I've never really thought of it like that. Yeah, neither. You're interviewing the company. It makes yeah. so much sense, but yeah. Because it does, it, event, it essentially does boil down to do I want the job or not? Yeah, if they exactly. offer it to me, then. The and and you need to, and it's your job, isn't it? It's your yeah. career, yeah. it's yeah. your responsibility. You're yeah. owning this situation. So, so you know, take control mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and think about it as well. This is where I, is this, do I want to, when I leave this place, if, if I, um, do I, I want to get back in the car and I want to think, do I want to work here or not? Yeah. Mm. And if it's, if it's no, then, then that's fine. You've been through another interview. You're, you're, you're starting to figure out what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But it removes that whole, I hope they like me, because that's irrelevant. Imagine yeah. if you go for an interview with somebody and you really like the person that's interviewing and you have a real rapport with them. Yeah. And, and then, you know, that interview happens in May and then you're going to start in September. And in September, guess what? They've left. And yeah. now you've started the job because you had a nice interview. Well, that's, you know, yeah. who's going to be, the, who's your boss now? You don't like that person. So yeah. it shouldn't be about who you like. It should be about, it should be much deeper than that. And it should Definitely. be more intelligent than that. Definitely. Yeah. I think as well, you, you're sort of told to act a certain way in an interview. And for yeah. a lot of people, that can be so different to how they actually are. Mm. So yeah. you're almost, you're like auditioning for a role that you're never going to be able to fill because... Mm you're then going to sort of land in a bit of trouble when you start the job and yeah. you've had to act a completely out of character in your interview and then you almost can't be yourself when you start that job. Yeah. It's really important to be authentic and for yeah. it to be you and, and for them to be authentic as well and for, for you to expect that authenticity to come back at you as well. Mm. You know, this is, you know this, is, um, this is just a role that you're going to take. It's not life or death. It's a job that you're going to do for the next couple of years. And you both need to make sure it's going to be a great experience. And if it's not, that doesn't mean they're a bad company yeah. or that you're not an amazing person. It just means that those two, those right. two people just weren't going to be right for each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, a little, little bit different to that, but obviously a lot of our, of our guests and hopefully a lot of our listeners will go on and set up their own businesses and they'll be business owners. How do you make sure you hire the right person as a business owner? Yeah, that's a really tricky question because um, I think, again, we can focus on people that we like um, and we can often employ people like us. Yeah. Um, I, I w when I um, ran my apprenticeship business, I was, I was really lucky that a whole bunch of the people that, I wor that worked for me um, were better than me at some of the stuff. You know, had, you know it was like you, I could never do that, what you do over there. So in, in employing people that are better than you employing people that can do things that you can't do, but don't employ yourself. You know, don't, oh, I'm going to put this because they remind me of me, so I'm going to take on somebody like that. Um, if they've got the same skills as you, they're not really bringing anything yeah. additional into the, into the business. No. You know, um, I, I find um, the nitty-gritty of um, back office spreadsheets and stuff like that, I find it really challenging. Um, so, so when we're in a position to be able to um, to be able to take somebody else on, it's going to be how, 
right, if I could do a bit less of that, um, then I could I could spend a lot more time doing the stuff I feel I'm better at. Yeah. But there's no point re no point recruiting some a young me to do that because they're not going to be able to do that either. Yeah. You know. So I think it's being being clear about what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, you know what what things that you want to you want to get rid of. What what things that you or you want somebody else to do that, that that you're not so great at. Right. And on the same topic, what makes you a good boss? What would make you a good boss to your employees? I think um, I think to be a good boss is to understand. I mean, when I, when I ran my business, I understood that it was my business, you know, so, um, and that, that is a difference through being your business and your job. There was, a, there was a real difference there. So I understood that it was my business. But I think understanding that people wake up in the morning from different places, you know, we, you know, those of us that are here today doing this, you know, different things happen to us today that would, that would mean that somebody might have, um, been running late, somebody might have been challenged, somebody might have had an argument, somebody might have been stuck in traffic, some, all of those things, and just have some empathy towards everybody else's life. I think there is nobody ever that gets up in the morning and thinks, I hope this is a rubbish day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we all get up hoping it's going to be a great day, and sometimes it's not, and so th being supportive around that for that person is, is important. And remembering yeah, they, they didn't come in hoping to mess that job up, they didn't come in hoping to be late. Yeah. It, it, stuff happens. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I like that. And just to, just to round up, we don't normally ask this question this way, but I think for you it's very fitting. What, would you, uh, what advice would you give to a person that was leaving school that had absolutely no idea what they wanted to do? Okay, so um, talk to people. That, I think the single most important thing that you can do um, if you have no sense of direction and, and I don't mean that in a negative way because you know, you've been at school. Um, so I, I think the most powerful thing you can do is talk to as many people as possible. So, so you might have figured out, oh, I don't want my job to be indoors. I want it to be outdoors because I'm an outdoor person. So, I'm, I'm, so, so talk to, I, I talk about on my, on my webinars about having five agents. Um, and, and that are gonna that are gonna be your representatives. You know, film stars have agents and go and get work for them. Five agents, and and that's probably gonna be one of them is gonna be your parent. It could be a neighbour that you know you've you've um, known for for years and years and years. It could be a relative. Could be your mate's dad, mate's mum. Just five adults that can help you out, and then just go and speak to them and say, do you know what? I really would like to work outdoors. I would really like to work in law. I would really like to be. Um, I really like to work in engineering. I don't know anybody that does that. Can you help me find somebody to talk to? Yeah. I often then talk about um, using their Facebook because kids don't use Facebook at all. So put a post on your Facebook page because adults do use Facebook and it's adults that have got the contacts. Mm. So put a post on your Facebook page, share it with your key adults, ask them to share it and say, hey, my grandson, my nephew, my godson is looking for to talk to somebody in law and um, does anybody know anybody and stuff will happen then and people will come in and say oh yeah my because they're connected to you that connection is already there. there's an emotional connection and they'll say oh yeah my um my friend is a lawyer i'll make i'll, I'll ask him to have that conversation and then you have that conversation prepare well for it because you're interviewing them and and find out as much as you can and then keep in touch with that person and build up a network but if you were to talk if you were unim if you were leaving school now after your a levels and had no idea what you wanted to do, and you spoke to one person a week for the next, for the next three months, it will change your life. Because in 12 yeah. weeks time, you will have had co 12 conversations with people that are shedding a light on stuff. So I think talking to, getting out there, putting yourself out there and saying, I, I wanna find stuff out. I don't believe that there is gonna be a lightning bolt that's gonna come down, gonna strike you, and you're gonna think, oh gosh, all the while I knew I wanted to be this. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. You have gotta get out there and talk to people. Absolutely. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I'll, I'll right, that's, that's us done, Dale. So thank you very much for yeah, joining thank us. Thank you for coming on. It was a brilliant conversation. Thank yeah, you. Really it's a pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Great. Right. Thank you for watching the latest episode of the Lessons Podcast. Please like, comment, subscribe, and interact in any way you can. Also follow our social media channels at student.dot. Student thank you.